Okay, so I'm going to discuss briefly vector fields today, and then hopefully everything that we discussed last time to do with the tangent space is going to make a lot more sense when I go through a simple example. So I'll just remind you that last time we showed that at every point in the manifold we have this vector space called the tangent space, which is given the name Tp of n. So this is the tangent space at the point P of our manifold. So if this is our manifold, at every point in the manifold there exists a vector space, a tangent space, and we kind of saw how we constructed this space by considering any kind of smooth curve that we can draw through the particular point, and then the tangents to these curves produce the tangent vectors. So all of that discussion was perfectly valid, however, the tangent space that we constructed is only at a single point. So if we wanted to talk about now a vector field, which we would intuitively understand as being a vector defined over the entire manifold, we're going to need some new technology in able to do this. Now if we want to talk about vectors at separate points, they live in their own independent tangent spaces. As vector spaces, they're completely independent. We couldn't say, for example, take a vector at this point, say Q, and add it to a point P in the TP tangent space. They're separate vectors, they live in entirely separate vector spaces. We'll see later on how we can have a way to kind of talk about the vectors of nearby tangent spaces using something called the connection, which is going to be vital for us when we want to define something known as the covariant derivative. But for now I'm just going to discuss how we can talk about a vector over the entire manifold, or a vector field. So we have our tangent space, and we can construct this at every point in the manifold. So if we do that over the entire manifold, we'll have a large collection of tangent spaces that effectively cover the entire manifold. And then all we need to do to define a vector field is simply come up with an assignment of a vector into each of these tangent spaces. Now that sounds more complicated than it actually is. All we're essentially doing is defining a vector that exists in all of the tangent spaces and that effectively agrees on overlapping regions. So if you'll remember, if we have two charts that overlap, the charts need to agree on the overlap region. Well, it's the same when we're trying to define a vector field. Any vectors that lie in two overlapping charts, they have to agree. Okay, so this is just kind of schematically how we define a, ve a vector field. We start by defining the tangent space at each point, and now I'll give some terminology that's sometimes called the tangent fibre. So the tangent space at each point is called the tangent fibre, and then we consider the collection of all such tangent fibres, or effectively take their union, we're formed the tangent bundle. Okay, so this is just terminology. It is in fact terminology to do with fibre bundles, which is something we're going to eventually come to talk about in future videos, but for now I'm just going to speak loosely. Essentially, the tangent bundle is the collection of all the individual tangent fibres, and each tangent fibre is essentially the tangent space at each point. So the collection of all the tangent spaces over the entire manifold defines the tangent bundle. And vector fields live in this tangent bundle. OK, so let's talk a little bit more about what a vector field is and what it does. So if you'll recall, last time we saw that a vector at the point P, now, we could use the following expression. We say that the vector, now remember we have to act on something, so it's acting on a function, was given by this kind of velocity of the function when it acts on the curve. Remember we had these things which we call integral curves which essentially just define the direction that the vector is pointing in. Now when I was writing this down you'll recall that I told you we need to evaluate this at the point we're talking about. So you might remember that I could rearrange this whole thing and get it in terms of 
rather than the phi curve which lives on the manifold, we can talk about this in terms of the chart entirely. So we saw that we could rewrite the function in terms of this thing x mu, which was the image of the curve in the chart. And then I told you that we have to evaluate this all again at the point P. And now I said that these dx mu by d lambdas, these are effectively the components of the vector in the chart. And then this df by dx mu, this is the, the basis part of the vector which acts on the function. So when I was writing all that down, this was all okay, but I probably forgot to stress that all of this is happening at the single point P. Now to make the extension or the generalization to vector fields, all we need to do is just stop evaluating at the point P and consider the vector over the entire manifold. So if I really wanted to be completely explicit here, I should have written the vector is acting on the function at the point P. So rather than eating an entire function, it's just eating the function evaluated at P. Okay, so then essentially the vector at the point will map the function evaluated at the point, which is just going to be a single number, and it's going to return a, a d-tuple of real numbers, or just a, a vector. And now this is all at the single point, whereas if we now consider the vector field acting on the entire function, so we feed the entire function into what's now a vector field, we essentially get what the vector would be at every possible point in the manifold. So I'll just kind of quickly summarize that then. A vector by itself is something which lives in the tangent space or the tangent fiber. This exists at a single point and it maps essentially a function evaluated at that single point into a vector or just a, a d-tuple of real numbers if our manifold is d-dimensional. Now rather than just talking about a single point, we could instead consider the whole manifold and we could evaluate, rather than at the single point, we could evaluate the vector on the entire function. And now this is going to produce a whole set of vectors, which are going to be what we would think of as the vector field. So now we usually like to say that a vector field, I'm going to give it the name V, is now a map from C infinity of M. So it's mapping smooth functions on the manifold into smooth functions on the manifold. Whereas in contrast, a single vector mapped, so if I call that V subscript P now, that maps a single kind of value of a function into just a, a real d-dimensional vector. Whereas now we're going to be mapped into essentially a, a vector valued function, which is defined over the whole manifold. And all we need to do to extend this general definition to a vector field is just stop evaluating at the point in question and consider the partial derivative basis as acting on the entire function. And now to do this, I kind of left implicit, but we required that this coordinate is valid everywhere on the manifold, or it covers the whole manifold. If it doesn't cover the whole manifold, that's still okay. We just need to make sure that where two coordinates overlap that might not cover the entire manifold, but if they overlap, we should have the same vector. The vector has to agree on overlapping charts. Okay, so that was just an overview of the terminology and just kind of generalizing from discussing vectors at a single point. Now I'll go through and show you a kind of simple example of how we would talk about a simple vector field.